All right, this message is going to be one of, this is a process to get to this point. You know, who was here in September when I kind of just shared every imperfect thing I went through? It was a mess. Well, this is part two. <laughs> just kidding. But this is more the healed Steve, the good Steve. <laughs> Don't need any more craziness to happen, but you know, it's, a couple weeks ago when I did the transition, I had this, um, I said something from the pulpit, I don't know if you guys remember it, but I do, so, but I'll remind you just in case you weren't, weren't here for it. But I used to have this issue, like where I'd say, like I totally believe that I would say, God loves you. I would been ministering for so long and I would always tell people, God loves you. God has a plan for you. And I would believe, like literally believe it for people, like I knew it, but I never, I had a hard time receiving it. Anybody ever been there before? Like, I knew it with all my heart. When I got ambushed by the love of God on September 22nd, 1995, I mean, I went from nothing, no church, to experiencing so much of God that it was incredible and almost over, actually very overwhelming. I didn't really know what to do with it. So when I got, but I didn't, getting hit with so much, no one really taught me how to foster it. So to me, God was still like, this distant guy in the sky, I knew he loved me, and I worshiped more out of like, thank you, God, you're awesome, this is cool, and I always worship like this, and I was like so excited about God, but I was like, but I didn't think he really cared about me. I just felt like I talked to him, I almost had a fear of him, and I almost sat there going, man, uh, I don't really know what to say because I really had this fear. You guys want to hear a confession? This is probably why I was so messed up. The very first, this is why discipleship is so important. I went from no Bible to getting ambushed by God. You want to know the first book I read when I got saved? Job. <laughs> I just, so I'll do the typical joke. I actually did say this to my grandma. I was living with my grandma at the time. I said, Grandma, I'm reading the book of Job. She laughed. She said, that's what you need to get. But it's Job. But it's seriously, that's how I pronounced it. But I struggled. But this is my mentality even back then. I was like, if that happened to the most righteous man, I'm going to sin just a little bit. But see, it's funny. Did it, okay, am I the only jacked up person? Don't start with Job and you'll be fine. But I literally would sin on purpose and go, I'm good. My family won't die. I didn't have a family at the time. I won't lose, I didn't have a job, I don't know, I should have just been like him, I was like, I don't have anything for him to take away, but I had this, this thing with God, I was like, you're just so far away, so distant, I really didn't know what to do with you, and this went on for about 15 years, and then finally I get to this point in my life, God sends someone into my life named Chad Norris, and I don't know how we met, I, I read his book, and I emailed him, I said, hey, can you come speak at my church, but it wasn't meant to speak at my church, he really... We had this moment on my porch, and he looked at me and said, I'm not here to speak at your church. I'm here for you, and I want to tell you about Abba. I went, who's that? Like, I was confused. I was like, I've heard of God. Like, I've read it in the Bible, but I didn't really understand it. He goes, I'm going to teach you about this father that's in heaven wants a relationship with you as a son. I was like, I don't know what you're saying. He goes, I don't think you get this. This God that knows your innermost being, it's more than just you preaching sermons and getting people saved and discipling them. Do you know this Father wants to be with you? He wants so badly for you to just stop for a moment and let him love you for a moment. Like I struggle, anybody else in here the struggle with being loved on? And I just sat there going, I don't know what to do with this. Like, I was a wreck, and he just kept on prophesying. He's, like, reading my mail and just sharing stuff, and I'm just sitting there going, this happened for 72 hours. Like, every time I met with him, he would just speak more into me, and I was just so intrigued by this father that wanted to be with me. And I started picturing even the times when I would play baseball with my dad or football with my dad or even go riding bike with my dad, and I started picturing, and God is sitting there going, I want that relationship with you. And I just sit there going, I don't even know what that means. 
I don't even know what to do with all of this. And so that was about six or seven years ago when I met Chad, and I kind of we emailed back and forth and text back and forth and had, had a couple phone calls, even flew down and talked to me some more. And I just I listened to all his sermons, I read his books. He's he's part of he's on the Finger of God videos. You guys watch those? We brought Darren Wilson. And he's in those videos, and he kind of just helped me. And I listened to his messages, and he talked about friendship with God and this relationship with God. And I sat there, and you know, I feel like it was here, right? And I could start telling people, and I even preach it in the refuge going, hey, God loves you. And, he, and I was like starting to feel like I was believing it. And he, he wants a friendship with us. He wants a relationship with us. It was like I was a little kid again, but it still had a hard time penetrating my heart. Anybody ever been there before? Like it was, I was like, I get it. I'm starting to understand it. And I would get closer and closer. And like I'd feel the presence of the Father just like, I would feel tangible hugs of God. And like I would start weeping. And it would go on for a moment. But it was almost like the enemy would try to steal it away. And he almost liked my distant relationship with the Father. And I kept on going and kept going in and out. So about two year, year and a half ago, two years ago, I'm so bad with time. My wife always has to correct me. God said this. Oh, the Holy Spirit said this. He goes, I want you to read the book of Jeremiah, but I want you to read it with a father's heart for his children. You see, I still had this idea of God. Like, I can understand a God that can kill both soul and body and throw it into hell. That God I related to. That God I got. I was like, I fear you. And even when I even first got saved, I was at the altar every week weeping. I don't even know why. I screwed up and I was just like, just don't send me to hell. I should have been discipled. I was so jacked up. <laughs> no one really wanted to take a chance on me. <laughs> That's funny. I heard my wife laugh because it's true. No, I'd ask people to disciple and they, they, people would even say I'm too messed up. So this is what you get. You're welcome. <laughs> But I sit there going, I had such this distorted view of God. And he said, I, and I'd read the book of Jeremiah, and I'd only remember the parts where he's like, Babylonians are going to destroy you. And I'd sit there going, maybe they need to get right with God, and everything will be fine. Like, I got it, and I understood it. But I would skip over the, I love my people. And like, it's, it was almost like I was blinded to it. It was weird. And he said, I want you to read this. With the view of a father. Now, being a father, I'm sitting there going, I can, I can probably do this. And so here I go. And this is a hard book. So I started reading it. And I'm sitting there going, man, the Israelites are more jacked up than I am. So just picture, any sin you've ever done, they did it probably worse. So I'm just going to sum up a lot. <laughs> but I sit there going, these guys are jacked up. They made a lot of mistakes. They make me feel good about myself. Anybody else sin in this place? Yes, I'm with family. Thank you. But I sit here going, this, is, this wrecked me. In, in chapter 3 of Jeremiah, in verse 19, it says this. I thought to myself, I love to treat you as my own children. I wanted nothing more than to give you this beautiful land, the finest possession in all the world. This part, oh my gosh. I looked forward to your calling me Father. I wanted you to never turn from me, but you have been, un oh, that's verse 20. You're not going to get that, but you've been unfaithful to me. And I, I sat there, I don't know how I skipped this for 20 years. Have you ever had that happen? Then all of a sudden it's highlighted, like it is blinking. It is like, like a Vegas strip lights, like it is hitting me. And it says, I just wanted to treat you as my own ch children. This is all the father wanted. His, his children, who he wanted more than anything, is just walked away from him. And he's sitting there going, all I wanted, all I ever wanted was to treat you as my own children. This is anything I wanted. I'm sitting there going, you don't want to destroy them? This is literally my question to God. I thought you wanted to destroy them. And he's saying, no. Read it again, Steve. He goes, but I want you to look at this one part. And he said, I just look forward to them calling me father. He said, Steve... That's all I want from you. Can, I just want you to call me father. And I just sat there and I just went, I don't know. Like I've written books and I've put Abba in it. 
But a lot of it's forced. It's almost like I'm trying to force this, like I'm trying, have you ever tried to love something? And I'm like putting it, I have a ministry called Encountering Abba. Like it's trying to, I'm trying to force this love. But at this moment, when I read that, I heard the, I just felt everything in my, every like wall in my body from my head to my heart just crack open. And I began to weep. I am a freaking crybaby. I do it every service to the youth almost every service, and Lucas makes fun of me every time. He's like, oh, big Mr. Pastor kid, just kid, cries all the time. Real tough. He's real tough. I'll wrestle him. Ben- Benji's, I'll wrestle him. He just cries all the time. <laughs> Shout out to my homies. But I am a baby. But I weep because something broke. And I'm sitting here looking at you guys like, this is like, who beats themselves up when they mess up and feel like, man, I am worthy to hell. I should just go to hell. God should have nothing to do with me. He shouldn't even be around me. And my mind becomes a human punching bag sometimes. Even if it's just the little thing, I'm sitting there going, I don't even know what to do. And the father's just sitting there going, just come to me. (laughs) You don't understand how good I am. And here's my friend Chad always, he speaks about God is good, God is kind. And I'm sitting there going and it's repeating in my head, he's like, he is good, he is kind. You can trust your father. And I'm sitting there going, I don't know. So when I did mess up, you know, during that dark period I went through, I sinned also. (laughs) And... But during that time, I learned the Father loves me. It's not so I can keep sinning and keep feeling that love. But I felt a love. Like, one time, I can explain it like this. One time, I I don't know how you guys feel about spankings, but um, I was spanked when I was a child. Oh, the worst feeling in the world is touch your toes. When my dad said that, I'd be like, oh, my gosh. It was worse than the spanking, the anxiety that goes on in your heart. And I would already start crying and moving (laughs) before he'd even spank it. But one time, he got me pretty good. I don't know where you feel about this. I don't know how you feel online. Do not report my dad. He does love me. Does not spank me anymore. (laughs) That would be awkward. I'm sure you would like to. But I sit there going, you know, I remember this time I was about 10 or 11, and I did some, and I just heard, you're going to have to touch your toes, and I just went... I was thinking, how fast can I go to the bathroom and put toilet paper in my pants because this is going to hurt. But I, he didn't let me. And I remember going to the bathroom and I mooned the mirror <laughs> and I just saw these kind of red marks and I was like, ah, that hurts. And I walk out of the bathroom and I remember my dad coming to me and he said, come here. I was like, that's ah, okay. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I don't want... the Last time I came to you, that didn't happen. That didn't like the outcome. And he goes, I want, and he put his arms out. He said, you know I love you, right? I was like, yeah, yeah, I guess. But I remember, like, back then I was like, you're kind of a jerk. That was kind of mean. But now that I've got to process it, I began to understand, like, my father loves me. And God kind of brought me to that moment. He goes, I do love you, and I do care. But it brings me to a fresh perspective. This mindset leads me up to this, and it's Jeremiah 29. And we're very familiar with this passage of Scripture, right? The Israelites, you know, over and over, the Father just kept on telling, us, telling the Israelites, you can turn around right now, and this, this destruction will not happen. And they literally would give God almost the middle finger. Like, we don't want you. We don't want nothing to do with you. Like, these are things that would come out of their mouth. We want nothing to do with you. And God would just over and over, this father sitting there going, none of this happens. Even as the Babylonians are sitting outside the wall, sitting there going, even if you turn around now, I'll stop this. Like, this is good stuff. And like, I'm hearing from a father's heart going, yes, yes. So I'm like yelling. I'm like reading this going, just stop so I can stop reading. This is so many chapters. We can stop this now. That's funny. I don't care who you are. 
And I sit there going, and I hear it, and I'm beginning to hear the father's heart, even with my own children. If they keep doing stupid things and going to the right, I'm going, hey, 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 come back over here, come back over here. If you go on the left, I'm like, come back over here. This is not good. If you stop right now, let's, we could just go forward. And God is just crying out for his people. And he's just sitting there going, we can, seriously, but they don't. They keep doing what they're doing. Who's ever been warned by God, but you still did it? I better not be the only hand. I got all four up. I'm a jacked up person. I should make you feel good about yourself. So in verse 10, I want us to have a fresh look at this. And it says in verse 10, he says, this is what the Lord says. You've got to understand, the whole city is destroyed. Dead bodies are still smelling up the air. Like babies, women, adults, like everywhere. This place is destroyed. War happened and the Babylonians took over and they took a remnant away. And these people are in chains. So imagine this. So Jeremiah 29, 11 and 10 through 14 do not fit the graduation story. These people royally messed up. And this is when God, this is what I love about this scripture. And I begin to see the father's heart in this. And he said, you will be in Babylonia, Babylon for, for 70 years. So you must understand there are consequences if you continue to do what you're doing. Amen? If you want to keep doing it, don't. It, but that doesn't mean the Father does not still love you. But this is what I love. He goes, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised. And I will bring you home again. Can you imagine, as they're sitting side by side, chained up, blood, beat up, scarred, a lot of them have lost their family members, they're pretty messed up going, what just happened? And can you imagine these words coming to them? And God the Father is sitting there going, I still will come for you. Think about this. This is a good father. And when I've messed up, this is what I need to hear. When God is sitting there, can you now picture your life sometimes? When you messed up, when you mess up, do you feel good going, this is awesome? You feel like your whole city has been destroyed. And the enemy wants to keep you there. And he says there, he goes, but then I will come and do all the good things I have promised. I will bring you home again. For I know the plans I have for you. He's sitting there going, I haven't stopped dreaming with you. Good things are going to come your way. This is what a father does. This is what a good father does. And this took me 20 years to get to this point. Because I used to read this going, yeah, but not for me. I've screwed up too much. I have totally exhausted your 7 times 70. I can't imagine how many bad thoughts God is sitting there going, what the heck, dude? The things I've said, the things I've done. And I sit there going, but that's not for me. And when I finally got this revelation of who the father is, he said, Steve. And during this three years, he goes, I still have a plan for you. Someone needs to hear this tonight. He still has a plan for you. And you are literally chained up right now, bound to some sin, addiction, or something. And he's sitting there as a father going, I still got a plan for you. He said, and I love this, they are plans for good and not disaster. Can you imagine taking that in? Just take that in for a moment. You royally messed up. And your dad is saying, they are plans for good and not disaster. You should be having like a happy face in your heart right now. <laughs> like, because he could have said is, screw you all, I'll start over. So, oh, I probably can't say that. <laughs> I am so sorry. Just put a beep in that, Tyler. <laughs> oh, gosh, I'm so Sorry. But I love this even more. He goes, to give you a future and a hope. When you feel like you're bound to addiction and sin, 
it's hard to believe that God has any future or any hope for you. Right? Am I talking to some real people here? Like, can we get rid of church for a second? Like, we've all sinned in this place. Don't act like you haven't. The church is a hospital. No pastor's perfect. I've hung out with them for 20 years. They're just as jacked up as everyone else. We just hide it better sometimes. Can I be honest? I've messed up. I've done things my family should not even be with me. I was not a good pastor. But when I stopped pretending and just let the Father love me, I'm a lot healthier. And I feel like sometimes we put on this mask and we kind of just go through church. And sometimes we forget the goodness of the Father. If the Father can just sit you down for a second, I don't think he cares about any of this. Sorry. I do this for a living. I think he just wants us. I think sometimes, I, if I was picturing this as I was putting this together, and I, I think I look at the father sitting down like with Aaron, and I just see him going, can you just stop for a second, buddy? I don't, I'm tired of your prayers right now, and everything you want, and all these things, and all these things going on in your life. I get it. I understand it. But let's just talk, man. Let's go hang out. When's the last time we laughed together? When's the last time we enjoyed and just high-fived and went to have ice cream, right? When's the, like, sometimes we just put on this thing and this show for God, and he's sitting there going, I just want to be your father and hang out with you. He knows we sin. He knows we mess up. We all do it. But he always says, I'm full of unfailing love. That means never-ending. This God will never stop pursuing you. And it's not before you to be this righteous person and raise your hand and you go to church and get other people saved. He literally wants to hang out with his children. My favorite thing to do is not disciplining my kids and making sure that they're doing their homework. My favorite thing is with my daughter. I love going into her room and sitting down and she massages my hands. So there's a little, found out now she's really good at that. So now I have an ulterior motive. But I go into her room, I love to sit with her. We love to get ice cream together. Do you want to know my favorite thing? That is my favorite thing to do with my daughter. Not once have I sat there going, man, I'm going to define you by anything that you do. I just love to be with my daughter. With my son. What I love to do with my son is play basketball with my son. I love to hang out with my son. I love his stinking stories. They're so funny. He's hilarious. What I love about my family is when we have game nights. I haven't won one game night ever. In my head, I'm cursing. I am. I'm looking to see if my wife's cheating. Oh, you guys have never cursed in your head. Come on. But I'm like, my wife has to be cheating. But when I'm 80 years old, if I make it, I'll sit there and go, those are things I remember. I'm not going to remember all these crazy times when we had to plan for a vacation or I had to pay bills. Who's going to remember that? But I remember times I spent with my family, and I'm looking at God saying the same thing. I'm not so worried about your sin right now, guys. I'm worried about you coming to me and hanging out with me and having a relationship with me. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Like, this is what he longs for. This is what he desires. He says this in Jeremiah 13. I don't have it on the screen. It's just popped in my head. He says this about his people. As a loincloth clings to a man's waist, so I created Judah and Israel to cling to me, says the Lord. They were to be my people, my pride, my glory, and honor to my name, but they would not listen to me. Do you hear anything out there going, I can't wait to build temples and churches and build these things? These things are good. They're part of the kingdom. Yes. But he says, I just wanted you to cling to me. Just, what does cling mean? Hang out with. Be with. 
Communion. Do you guys see what I'm saying here? Sometimes some of you guys are looking at me like I'm like speaking Spanish and I can't speak it at all. <laughs> the youth kids speak Spanish to me all the time, and I'm like, I have no idea. Aren't you Mexican? Yes, but I still can't speak it. <laughs> Donde? <laughs> now they're texting in Spanish, so now I gotta get the translator. I don't know what you're saying, but I sit here going, it's almost like a foreign language to the church that the Father absolutely desires one thing from you, and that's you. When's the last time not had a Bible study with God, not had this crazy thing with God, but you sat there with him and just said, let's just talk. And he's calling every single one of us to this place to be with the Father, to hang out with the Father. You know you're forgiven, right? It's a simple thing. The Father is not like perplexed in heaven going, oh no, Eliphaz, sin today. He's not, I shouldn't have used that. Pat, sin today. <laughs> that is more likely. <laughs> Just kidding. But I'm going to end it with this, but I'm going to have that band start coming up. We're going to do a song, and I, I want us to get to this place with the Father. And I feel like I'm going to just have you guys, you can just rest for a moment. Um, it's kind of weird in the youth room, I tell the kids they can lay down, relax, <laughs> and just hear from God. But I feel like some of you guys just need to hear this. He says this to his people, I will bring Israel home again from captivity and restore their fortunes. This is what a good father does. You guys get this? This is what a good father does. I will honor them and not despise them. Their children will prosper. They will be my people and I will be their God. And this is my favorite part. He says, I have loved you, my people. And I want you to do this. I would say my name. I, I loved you, Steve, with an everlasting love. I think for a moment, for the next 10, 15 minutes, I want us to forget just at all. Just forget we're even in church. I know that's kind of hard. But I, I, I feel like, can we get rid of religion and church and rules and regulations and just get with the Father for a moment? You guys okay with that? I'm sorry, I only know one way to talk. I come from a rough background. I just not only know I need a real Father. A father that just says, Steve, all I want is you. Know how awesome to hear that? That the one that created everything, that had breath, that breathes into just a dust and, and a human comes out, is sitting there going, Steve, out of bi seven billion people in this world, I still want to hang out with you. And I stop saying, well, I'm so messed up. God made a masterpiece here. The scriptures even say it. He is crazy about you. So crazy about you. He is so full of unfailing love and forgiveness. But it's so much more than that. It's almost like, let's get the forgiveness out of the way. Just let me love you. And I feel like someone needs to hear it, that it's just penetrated their heart so bad. Like, you need that breakthrough. Like, you've tried and tried and like, I know God loves me. I just don't, I'm having a hard time receiving it. I'm just having a hard time. And I, I just, you just need to get to this moment where you just say, yes. <laughs> if I mess up now, I don't beat myself up now. I go to the Father and He says, I still have plans for you. I still have a future for you. I still have a hope. 
Isn't that awesome? 